Okay, so hello everyone. I hope that uh, this meeting is going to be useful for you as it's going to be for me. Not every time I can, not every day I can sit down and talk to architecture students that are going to be, you know, building the future and thinking now about that design. So for me, it's uh, really good to have this conversation with you. I'm going to try to do my presentation very short because I would really love to hear more about your ideas and what's uh, in your mind right now and what are your plans for the future, which is quite important for students. And for me, because of my job, I really need to know about these things because my job is to think about the future. So, OK, so I am from Peru. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, good. So I'm from Peru in Latin America, close to Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and I decided to become a molecular biologist. So after when I was 21, I think I left Peru and I've been living in different places, mainly in Europe, in Finland, Sweden, Germany, and then I moved to Australia to do my PhD on sex development, which means how the X chromosome and the Y chromosome dictate gender in humans. But when I finished my PhD, I thought that I want to do something more applied. I want to do something that is going to be tackling a global priority. I want to do something that is not going to be forgotten in the academic realm and maybe never be in use. But I didn't know what to do. So I started doing, going to conferences on international development, something completely far away from molecular biology. And then I discovered uh, science diplomacy, which means that you can use your scientific background to help to shape policies in different governments, for example, or you can help to promote international cooperation in a scientific way and many other things. So I really like this. And that's how I started going into the world of science and policy making. And that's actually my job now at the center. And I arrived in the UK in March, very recent. So I was at the, at the office two weeks and then everything just exploded and I'm working from home since then. So I guess that the, the million dollar question is, which event can make humanity collapse? And I guess all of you may have some ideas based on the literature that you read, the pop culture that you are exposed or scientific data that you may have already been reaching out in order to know what's gonna be happening in the future and how that in impacts your career and professional development. So I think that many people can come up with answers for this question. So for me, the real question that is more important than this one is how can we manage, which means prevent or mitigate those type of events that can bring humanity to collapse. And for that, I think it's very common for people to think about a doomsday, uh, apocalypses, you know, and the angels with the trumpets in the clouds and storm and everything. So I like to think about the future and catastro catastrophic events in a way that I really think that the future can be nice and it can be good, not just for a certain part of the population or not just for humans, but the whole ecosystem and animals and everything that has life in this planet. So for that, I think that the trillion dollar question is, where is the trillion dollar question? Yes, is that how do we make the role of science in policy making more effective? Because you may have seen, for example, climate change is one of the events from the catastrophic realm of events that has been going farther than the rest. Is the one that has already the Paris Climate Agreement. We have Fridays of a strike with Greta and all the people that is really concerned, but still we don't make the mark. We're still, it seems that we are not gonna achieve to all these objectives. So it seems that the real problem is a political problem that we all have. So the question is like, how can we make science to really matter? Because I don't really think at this point, climate change needs to do more research to prove that climate change is happening and all the consequences are gonna happen. So what do you think is missing? Who is the stakeholder that is not uh, playing its role efficiently, and how are the race of stakeholders not really pushing forward for this agenda? So these are some of the things that the Center for the Study of Existential Risk wonders. And as you may already hear, uh, we are dedicated to the study and mitigation of risk that could lead to the human extinction or civilization collapse. 
Now, we have different type of risks. Risk. Some risks could be related to nature, like an asteroid collapse on Earth or a super uh, volcanic eruption that is going to be um, blocking um, the aerial space and transport and preventing food going from one place to the other one. But we also have the type of events that are more related to human activities, like, for example, the risk of a nuclear war or now we have COVID-19, but next time could be a virus that has been created in a laboratory, or we also have uh, the potential misuse of artificial intelligence. So all these type of events are part of our agenda in the center. And we always wonder what's gonna happen next, what's the black swans and how we can learn to manage them, to prevent them, and if it's too late to mitigate them. So for that, we have a very, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, sorry, group. I'm a molecular biologist, but my colleagues are sociologists, philosophers, lawyers, economists, people working on machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I think that this diversity really make us think about the problem, but about its solutions in a very holistic way. So I have learned, I've been learning during all these months about different type of things from, for example, equations about calculating the civilization collapse in China of I don't know how many years ago, or equations to understand algorithms and artificial intelligence. And why is this important to me? Because my role, as I, as I said before, is to make all this scientific knowledge that is being produced at the center to have some applied realm, to have some applied uh, work. And to do that, with what it means is that I need to translate these complex issues in a way that can be digestible and understandable and concrete and fast for someone that needs this information at the right moment. So you can think about policymakers. You can also think about uh, private companies. Perhaps insurance companies are also wor worrying about the future and they need to know what to invest or not to invest. Or what about the reinsurance companies? So everyone really plays a role and for me, citizens are the most important ones because I believe that uh, citizens are the ones that are gonna be electing the new governors or people in charge in our countries. And if they are not, if citizens are not concerned about certain things, they are not gonna push for those agendas to their elected um, um, people in government. So we really need them in our side. And as I said, my work is related to policymaking and science. And just to give you an example of the things that I've been doing, for example, we helped the Science 20, which is the group that, the scientific group that advises the G20 meeting. So the G20 leaders around the world meet every, uh, meets in one month, I think in Saudi Arabia, and they are gonna be talking about their economic agenda, political agenda. So what we did was to write some policy recommendations on foresight. Foresight is a method that allow us to think about the future. And within the war of foresight, we have different methods. There is horizon scanning, future scenarios, etc. You can go and take a look on those. And this type of methods help us, us as a scientist, but also to policymakers to be uh, wondering what's gonna happen and how to go to, if we have 10 future scenarios, maybe we can choose future scenario number three. So what do we need to do now which policies need to change now in order to go and reach the future. So that's why we wrote these policy recommendations on foresight because foresight is a method that is not widely spread within governments and even within the scientific community. It's something new that it has just popped pop out and we need to learn and see how we can use it in a way that is gonna be transformative. Uh, some other thing that I'm doing, for example, with the Biological Weapon Convention, the, this is a convention where all the countries that are interested on this topic make an agreement in order to prevent the creation of the use of bioweapons. So everyone that signs for this meets every year to talk about how much they have advanced, who is doing what, there are monitoring special committees coming to these countries to see that everything is in order and okay. So every five years, there is a really big exam, let's say like evaluation of what's happening if, it, if the convention is working or, or not. So what we are gonna do with CSER and BWC is to have regional workshops. And in these regional workshops, what we are gonna do is to 
talk about global catastrophic risk, talk about new trends, and if some policies need to change, and if some countries will be keen to adopt some new policies so we can test them. And the BWC likes our work, and we thought that they are a good channel to reach to these countries, and we're going to have those workshops happening next year. The International Network for Government Science Advice is uh, a network that does that, uh, reaches to scientists that are in, interested to advise uh, political leaders and trains them on how to do it. You don't need to be only a scientist because they also understand that all fields are important and they want to be as transdisciplinary as possible. So if you want to take a look on that and it's something that is interesting for you, I would suggest you to go and look there. And my work with the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction is based on the Sendai framework. Okay, so in the same way as the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement, we have the Sendai framework, which is again, an agreement that is signed by many countries that want to deal better with risk, global risk in general. And for doing this Sendai framework, they have a scientific research agenda that underlines their objectives, its values, what go they're gonna research about. And the last agenda was written in 2008, the Sentai framework was launched in 2015. And now they realize that the world is going so fast, the new trends are appearing so quickly that we need to re re redo this agenda. So now I'm part of the expert review group that is doing is giving feedback about how we can write this agenda in a better way. And of course, any ideas are welcome. And I would love to hear what your, your ideas because I need to write this report tonight uh, after this meeting. So let's talk more about that. Remember that question. And so on, so on, I have many works that are related to this type of work, so you can have an idea. And then what I also want to tell you, because I think that you are super young, and I think for me to decide to jump into a new path of career and journey came when I was 31 or 30, and you are 22, I think there are some things that I would like to let you know, so you don't have to be 30 or 40 to think about that. Maybe you already know them and is to look for a job where you're passionate about. And I'm sure that you all love architecture, but maybe there are different aspects of architecture that you like better. And when I wanted to jump from molecular biology to work on science advice, my brother told me, so you study biology for nothing. You should have a study international relations or something like this. You are dumb, you are silly, this is a waste of time. I don't know why you became a scientist. So I think that many people will always tell you that jump into new things uh, it's gonna be bad or it's not gonna be appealing for your career, but as long as it's a calculated risk, I think you should go and take for it. Take it, especially now when everything, as I said, especially technological advance goes so fast. And what you always have to think is, what do you love, what you're good at and what pays well? So you don't want to be doing voluntary work all your life, which I have been doing for so many years and I still do. So when the part that says what you are good at, I also want to remind you that it doesn't matter if you lack a lot of skills. For this type of job that I'm doing now, I had to relearn a lot of new things to talk to different types of specialists, to talk to politicians, and that's something that you learn. It doesn't matter if it takes you more time than the rest, but you will get there because I did. And yes, let me introduce you to some friends of mine because I think these are important things that have shaped my life. And I'm sure that you will also have some key people that will shape your life. So this is my friend Eliana. We used to live in Lima in a house of nuns because if you don't have parents in Lima or family in Lima and you don't have where to live, you can go to a residential place or you can go to a nun's house and then they give you a room and then you live there. So that's what I was doing. That's where I met her. And she's an architect. Uh, architect. And we met uh, three years ago and she was the first person that told me, you know, Clarissa, I'm tired to building all these buildings for people that are gonna be doing office work and lawyers or like dentists. And, you know, I want to think about, uh, and I think something happened about a tsunami in that moment. She said like, that is this uh, crisis with a tsunami. And I want to think about how to rebuild these cities. I want to think like how as an architect, I can think about, you know, helping communities to come back to the economic system, to come back to what their lives were in a better way. So I heard her and I saw like, oh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting and cool. I didn't even know about Caesar at that moment. So I just thought like, okay, that's good. Interesting, good for you. So now she's in Canada and I think she's doing a master on catastrophic events and architecture or something like this. So it's cool for her. I hope that 
she finds the job that she wants. And when I moved to Switzerland and the Geneva Center for Security Policy, there was one person working on this. And I told her like, I should put you in contact, but she didn't finish her career yet, but I will in the future. So what I wanna say is that there are people in international security nowadays working on how to rebuild cities that have been impacted by natural disasters. So maybe this is something that you already know, but you should be looking at who is who and how you can contact them. And the other person is Katia Salazar. We met in Australia. She was one of the Latins that I had a friendship with when I was living there. And she's now, uh, she made a, a master on uh, city planning and the future of cities. I also thought like, okay, that's really cool. But now I see how all these pieces, you know, fit together for me and for my work. And Angel Eduardo is a fellow with whom I did an Eisenhower fellowship in US. And he's the director of infrastructure projects at CAF, which is the, a bank for Latin America. And he also talks a lot about what's the future of cities, what is the new type of buildings. And I think that architects like you will be very good uh, to be working with him. So I think that for you, it's also interesting to look who is working in the IDB, on the World Bank and all these institutions and is working on infrastructure and they are already designing what's gonna happen after what the World Economic Forum calls the Great Reset, what is gonna happen after the COVID-19. And finally, uh, Lara Mani, she's a colleague at CSER. And I want to talk about her because she is now about to publish uh, an article about volcanic eruptions and the lack of infrastructures to deal with it. So I think that that's also some other thing that you can do to go and see which academics are doing which type of job and then reach out to them. And then you can even write scientific articles together. You can just propose an idea or you can say like, what are you working on? I can help you writing an introduction. I can help you doing research. And then you get a publication that I think you know, is not only good for your CV, but it's good for your scientific process on thinking about the methods and the ideas that can come from people that is a little bit more advanced in their careers. So I would like to just finalize this presentation by uh, giving you some, some questions and you are, um, I'll be happy if you answer them in the Q&I, but just take them for you if you have not thought about them yet. So one of them is like, do you think the infrastructure is gonna change after COVID-19? Are we gonna have like socially distanced offices or because now more people is working remotely, houses are gonna be, have to be, you know, reshaped in order to uh, have like three people working at the same time together, for example. Uh, I think one of my friends also told me like, if we have to be uh, at work and we have to be distanced from each other, like how many meters do we have? Do we have to have like this um, glass between our offices, etc.? Because nowadays everything is like open offices, right? How do you envision city planning on coastal cities when the sea rises? If you are a climate change denial, perhaps this is not an interesting question, but at least it's uh, good to think about those things. If it's not sea rise, what else can it be that is gonna affect how the current cities are being are built? So how do your architect architectural designs fit the big picture? And what's the, what's the really big picture for you? Because for me, when I was working on molecular biology, the big picture was to think about I want to make a discovery that is going to help in the world of biomedicine and it's going to cure people. The big picture for me now is to, is to think how I can prevent that humans lead other humans to their death and take all animals and living things with them. So I think at different ages of your life, it, uh, this answer is going to change, but it's good that you keep answering yourself and see how your mind evolves during your not only professional, but personal development. Who do you know that is already working on global catastrophic risk or existential risk? Do you know anybody? Is this the first person that you know? Am I the right person to know for what you want to do and you want to achieve? If I'm not, then you should be looking on LinkedIn or should be looking on Twitter who is saying what and who is working on what. What will you do to learn more about their work? I gave you already some ideas that you can contact them ask them to talk, sometimes they are very busy. So if you can come up with, you know, I have this idea for an article or I'm writing this for my thesis and I just want, you know, five minutes from you to talk about this specific issue. The more specific you can go, I think the more interest you're gonna get from the person that has too many things to do on the day, but 
will give you a space because you are also you also seem like an interesting person to know. You know what I mean? They also will benefit from this. So the last question will be, imagine that I'm someone, that I'm a philanthropist and I have a lot of money and I have a particular interest on global catastrophic risk and architecture. What would be your pitch? Give it to me now in one minute. You have to be ready. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know. Uh, and this, um, of course, this example is a philanthropist, but it could be a future collaboration. It could be your future boss. It could be your future business partner. So have always a one minute idea of what you're passionate about and say it to everyone, because that's the only real, real way and fastest way that I have had for making or achieving the things that I wanted during my personal and professional life. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> I think that was 20 something minutes. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clarissa. Um, shall we? Uh,